Hello, uh, today we'll talk about a very important uh, Canadi Canadian architect, um, Arthur Erickson. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. Uh, Arthur Charles Erickson uh, was born actually on June 14th, 1924 and died on, on May 20th, 2009, was a Canadian architect and urban planner. He studied Asian languages at the University of British Columbia and later earned a degree from McGill University School, School of Architecture. He is renowned for designing some of the most recognizable buildings and sites in Canada, including Roy Thompson Hall, Robson Square, the Museum of Glass, and the Simon Fraser University campus. Uh, I thought that, uh, you know, today we'll actually pay homage to him because it was uh, his birthday, but he actually uh, was was born on May 20th, well, died on May 20th, and he was born on June 14th. But we'll talk about him again on June 14th. Let's, uh, let's uh, contemplate a little bit his works. But first, let's contemplate his shoes and his, uh, his trousers. This was the man, uh, Arthur Erickson, whom uh, some consider to be the most important Canadian architect ever until now. A very important thing is this, that, that he studied Asian languages at the University of British Columbia and later, and, and later he studied architecture. But I think these preliminary studies that he made on Asian languages was very, very important. And we'll, we'll elaborate on this later because it had an influence on his architecture. Those um, Asian studies that he, um, um, you know, uh, studied. Sorry for those Asian studies that he studied. Terrible, terrible, um, uh, you know, expression. Here he is as a young man. Here he was as a young man, and um, intense and romantic. Some drawings of uh, Arthur Erickson. And the drawings, you know, architectural drawings, some more inspired, some less inspired, but he built some remarkable buildings. And uh, he had a, you know, a visionary side, so to speak, and this is shown by, by, by such, such a drawing that he made. Or even here, a sketch by Arthur Erickson. He built this building. He built this building. We are going to see them. Layered landscapes, drawings from the Canadian Architectural Archives, Arthur Erickson. Now, we begin with this house, uh, Killam Macy, Macy House in West Vancouver, British Columbia, 1955. Uh, here is not so spectacular as, um, as uh, he became later. But an early building, an early house. Here he is with a with a cat in his arms, and um, 1955. He benefited from a spectacular landscape very often because uh, you know around Vancouver that's how things are. Uh, another residence, 1958, British Columbia. As opposed to other modern architects, he was not afraid to also use stone and, you know, woodwork, uh, some of it uh, with an ornamental uh, uh, quality. So an interesting case, he first studied languages and then architecture and not any languages, but Asian languages. Another house from 1960 in Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta. Now he becomes a little bit more dramatic. An opulent house. This is not social housing, of course. 
plenty of uh, soft pillows, light from above, a lot of wood, very spacious uh, living room. Graham House, 1963, West Vancouver, British Columbia. This is one of his best houses, if not the best. In fact, it would be interesting to compare this house to Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. Because he assumed also, like Frank Lloyd Wright did with the Falling Water, water. You see, he, he builds over the water just as Frank Lloyd Wright did over the uh, uh, Falling Water. It's a fine building by, by Arthur Erickson, and I wish I lived there, but I don't. Anyway. Now you see here certain things that uh, the strict functionalist would protest against, and yes, it's not very sustainable. Why did he extend this piece of wood like this and like this? Because it is not for a you know a specific function, but it has a, a, a function in the emotional field or in terms of expression. You know, maybe an aspiration for the for the for the beyond, for the for the infinite. If I am to uh, use a rhetorical language, Arthur Erickson. And this intermingling between uh, the built and the unbuilt, meaning natural, is, is, is very finely tuned. I mean, the building is uh, open in various uh, ways, and then it floats above the water and the stones. And it's, 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 it's a building for men, but it's a building that assumes nature in a, in a you know, a nice interplay or, or a dialectical uh, uh, relationship. A spectacular setting, of course. Now, Macmillan Bloedel building in Vancouver, 1965. This is a, an office building. And uh, I would say is uh, as good as uh, some uh, similar uh, office buildings uh, or, uh, or apartment buildings built by IMP and others, you know, um, regularity rhythm but it has uh, it has uh, expressive force and uh, you know a, a certain uh, austerity even which is not um, um, you know uh, is not a negating uh, expression you didn't really expect you you would not have expected easily this kind of building after the house that we just saw but it's a very different function. It's an office building in a big city, and uh, I think it works. Arthur Erickson. Smith's residence, 1965, also in West Vancouver. Um, his own house is, in, I think, in West Vancouver, and I think uh, this presentation will end with uh, images from his own house. A very surprising house, very modest, considering he was a, a major architect in, in, in Canada, meaning with a lot of success. Large surfaces of glass, yes, meaning large uh, losses of energy. But at that time, there wasn't a concern for sustainability. And then someone who afforded such a house, obviously, would have afforded uh, to pay the electrical bill anyway. I'm not trying to excuse Arthur Erickson, but it was a different time. Today, probably, he would not have built in this way. But look at look at this, uh, these elements in wood which extends so much and, and you know with no apparent uh, function but the lack of an uh, uh, obvious function doesn't make certain elements in architecture irrelevant uh, simon fraser university 
it began, well, the first stage in 1965. This is a major university in British Columbia and a major effort both by the university to build it and pay for it and for the architect. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful building a lot of concrete, of course. A university building shouldn't be just functional, should also uh, stir up the imagination of the students, make them those torches that uh, Albert Einstein thought that students should be. If the building is uh, stirring up your uh, enthusiasm or exuberance or imagination, is warming up your, 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 your heart, uh, then it's possible that you learn better. You'll, 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 you'll uh, activate uh, those emotional forces which make you even a better student. So it's important to have a, a building that um, that is not banal, that is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, inspiring. If the building is inspiring, there is a chance that the student will also get inspired and uh, the effects can only be good, in my opinion. Another house, 1967. Arthur Erickson. Again, look at the landscape. Uh, this man had a chance to build in uh, uh, breathtaking um, uh, landscapes or environments. But his love of Asian language is probably also induced in him a love, an increased love for nature and appreciation for nature. Government of Canada Pavilion, Expo 70, and he won the top prize in uh, Osaka. This building I never quite understood. Uh, I didn't study it very carefully, but I couldn't find uh, enough information about it. There are pictures. Uh, this was a very famous expo in Osaka, and I understood in uh, 2025, Osaka will host again the World Exhibition. This was the Pavilion of Canada, uh, and it won the, the, the first prize, As, although there were many remarkable buildings in this uh, very famous uh, Osaka 1970 World Exhibition with important architects. Kenzo Tange, Arata Isozaki, Kionori Kikutake, and not just Japanese. Erickson won with the, the, the Canadian uh, uh, pavilion that you see some pictures of that I cannot really explain it because I didn't quite understand what was going on here, except that I see these reflections. Now, a temple from 1970 for uh, this, for me, mysterious uh, uh, religious denomination, also in Vancouver. Maybe he received this commission exactly because he studied Asian languages. This one uh, leaves me rather cold. It's a little bit too literal and uh, Yes, it's a citadel. It's a white citadel. It has purity, but uh, I mean, if it didn't have this thing at the top, maybe it would have been better. But maybe I'm a purist now and I shouldn't be. As you can see, he didn't have a signature way of doing architecture. 
University Hall at University of Lethbridge in Alberta, also Canada, 1971, another major building by him for a university program, and it's quite dramatic in its interplay with nature. Look at it. I mean, you have here the, the conflict, the tension, the drama between Earth and the work of man. But I think it's, it's done very convincingly. Arthur Erickson, Alberta. Not bad. Powerful. Uncompromising in its uh, de linear determination. And the dialectical relationship between the sinuous uh, landscape and the, um, you know, the, the crisp geometry of the long uh, or elongated prism is, uh, is, is very convincing. I, I feel like studying more this building. Because it is not lying. This is not a building which says I am, uh, you know, uh, making compromises. Uh, I am uh, softening uh, my stance in order to uh, give nature the predominant role. No, here you have the, what he did here is to tell the truth. The, the interaction between man and nature, between culture and nature in uh, sincere terms. It's a conflict, but what I see is harmony through contrast, the contrast between the landscape and the building. An elementary school in Vancouver, not a bad school. I wish I was schooled in such a school without, uh, you know, rectangular little boxes called classes, you know, an open, an open school. And I do think that people who, children who study in such an environment uh, probably uh, develop uh, democratic uh, uh, attributes and uh, an easiness to, you know, to be open towards the others for dialogue, for debates and so on under the big skylight or the, the, the glass the, uh, rooftop. Not bad. So these were some ideals of the 60s and early 70s. You know, openness, dialogue. You see, there are different classes of various uh, ages. You know, some children on the floor, others uh, look at the books on the shelves, others have a discussion, maybe the professors around the round table. You know, so is this um, hybridity and this openness that creates, uh, I think, a good society. Museum of Anthropology, uh, University of British Columbia, 1976. Sorry about the resolution of these pictures. Here again, we see the same interplay between building and trees or building and nature. And they enhance each other. Nature becomes even more precious in contrast to the building and the building becomes more precious in contrast with nature. Museum of Anthropology. Arthur Erickson.
the subway station in Toronto, 1978. Uh, he designed two or three. This is one of them. And even here, it's about architecture. You know, it's not just a utilitarian structure. Look at the ceiling. Uh, it has diagonals. It has uh, <clears throat> the rebellion of the diagonal. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a geometry which is engaging. And it matters, even if it's just so-called just a subway station. Because in a dynamic environment, probably we become, uh, you know, more inspired. Another subway station in Toronto, 1978. Evergreen Building, Vancouver, British Columbia. <clears throat> this was in 1978. So you know, 40 something years before our uh, interest in the so-called green architecture. And here it is. You could say, you know, something like this uh, could have been done or was done very close to it by Bjarke Ingels and Big, but he did this in 1978. And the geometry is a little bit rigid for my taste. There is uh, concrete, yes, concrete pollutes, but um, he climbed uh, with the green uh, tall levels. I don't think the building uh, has a, the, the right balance between um, l'esprit de geometry and l'esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of uh, fineness, to quote from um, Boileau. But, you know, there is an attempt again to humanize a little bit uh, raw concrete with with the green but it's still i think the building a little bit too deterministic for my taste and that's predictable a little bit anyway he tried something here uh, this is also an important work by him the provincial law courts is a is a Palace of Justice, if, if we are to describe it so, in Vancouver, 1978-1983. Uh, you know, all this transparency um, at the expense of, of course, um, you know, maybe uh, you know, needing air conditioning and so on, but when one goes to search for justice, it's very possible that, um, you know, such an openness, such a transparency could make one uh, believe that the judicial system uh, functions uh, because there is transparency, there is openness. There are no hidden, uh, you know, uh, little corners where who knows what could happen. It's, a, it's an architecture that uh, invites you to believe that justice will be achieved. And that's a very important thing. Now, yes, there is a lot of glass there. You wonder if, you know, today we would play some, um, you know, uh, uh, solar panels on, on this, um, you know, slanted uh, large surface, if it's oriented properly, and it seems that it is. Anyway, look at these stairs where he placed with two systems. This was done by other architects. I don't know who did it first, but it uh, it works. You know, and it's uh, it's rather interesting because you problematize a little bit uh, you, you introduce also this, the zigzagging. So it's not just going straight to the point, to the destination, but you could also follow, a, you know, a, a, a more gentle path, which is zigzagging. So you have both. It's an interesting idea. And again, some other people did it. 
Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, 1992. This building is rather immodest <laughs> or not modest, but its function was globalist, you know, large, you know, uh, meeting uh, space, very large, very centralized, perhaps too centralized, but this was, this was the function of the building. It's huge. His architecture is not totally devoid of a slight mundane uh, attribute or even a little bit of what I might call not very uh, appreciatively uh, commercialism. But uh, if you look at the, the, the top of the, the interior space, it's, it's rather impressive, you know, and, and also rather mysterious in its uh, symmetry and centrality. Without people. Nap Laboratories in Cambridge, England, 1983, Arthur Erickson. Concrete and glass, concrete and glass. I miss the trees. There are some trees there, but uh, rather <laughs> timid and static. Gun is the landscape from uh, Vancouver. King's Landing, Toronto, Ontario, 1984. Uh, housing complex. As you can see, he liked terraces. But after all these words, we are going to see his modest house, which I admire a lot. Uh, exactly because you wouldn't expect a, a builder of so, so many big buildings for a powerful country to live uh, so, uh, you know, in a, such a subdued way. Now, maybe here would have been good to have some vegetation to climb on the building. But even like this, somehow I, I, I like more this housing complex than the previous one that we saw, which, which did have green on each floor. Canadian Chancery in Washington, D.C. Now, here we see a problem with Arthur Erickson. Probably it was difficult for him to honor uh, the governmental function in Washington, D.C. The building is, is OK, but uh, there is a problem here. This part uh, with, the, with the columns around it, I think here is a dangerous uh, a reference to some sort of uh, you know, dogmatic classicism. Otherwise, the building is um, you know, moderately modern. But here, there is a touch of uh, Postmodernism, if I am to call it so, which personally bothers me. Yeah, I, 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 I think here is a problem. This kind of architecture is one thing, and what he had around it is another thing. The two systems seem to be uh, you know, in conflict. But maybe this is a gesture towards the you know, the diplomatic side of the, of the project, of the building. A civic center in uh, Markham, Ontario, 1989, huge. Well, 1989, already we, we almost uh, witnessed the demise of postmodernism. When was the, uh, this one built? 1989 as well. Large buildings, uh, you know, uh, one uh, governmental, the other one uh, also governmental. Huge, but this one benefits from fragmentation. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, you know, uh, crashing uh, monolith, although here it is. And the columns, the way he uses them uh, is a little bit, um, you know, uh, an echo of what postmodern is stood for, unfortunately. This one, when he when he worked with such a obvious centrality, I think he became a little bit uh, less convincing. 
not my point of view. All in all, postmodernism had uh, problematic uh, effects on architecture. A convention center in San Diego, California. This is an interesting building. It's uh, you know futuristic. There are these mysterious uh, uh, tubular or cylindrical uh, uh, spaces. I, I don't know what they are, but all in all, it's 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 a, it's a rather interesting building. San Diego. USA. I wonder what could they be? Although I'm not a functionalist, I am asking myself, what is their function? A city hall. California, 1991, huge. Also, I, again, I think uh, these big programs, uh, these big functions, um, which lead to a monolithic uh, centralized architecture were problematic for him. Fortunately, here there is a rift. I hope you see, from, yeah, you see this rift here. So this cut into the building, uh, saves a little bit uh, otherwise it's a you know a north american architecture of uh, large dimensions i wouldn't describe it, describe it as being modest no but maybe that was not the point uh, university of california McDonough hall i think some of these works are a little bit uh, uh, predictable. Maybe he didn't feel so comfortable to build in the United States. I don't know. To California Plaza, uh, Los Angeles, in California, two towers, 1992. You know, glass and glass and glass, no window opens. Air conditioning, air conditioning, air conditioning. The glory of uh, consume, consumption. The more, the better. I disagree with it, but that was the time. I think now we have to change. We cannot afford any longer to build in this way, these, uh, you know, all glass towers celebrating uh, the consumption of electricity. Uh, library, University of British Columbia, 1997. Again, a lot of glass here which is problematic, the demagogy of glass should be uh, considered critically, that is, but he didn't, too much glass for my taste. What a waterfall building in Vancouver, 2001, uh, again, uh, a lot of glass and concrete, but there are some interesting uh, things here. The, those stairs at the top part of the building these are apartment buildings. I hope you see them here. So he creates something interesting at the top of the building, thanks to these, uh, you know, moderately sculptural uh, stairs that go to the terrace. How is it called this project? Waterfall building. It's uh, the apartment buildings. Arthur Erickson. A heritage center, where is this? Uh, I have a feeling that, you know, all this success and all these large buildings, um, they, they became rather too self-satisfied. And I regret I don't have a picture with him around this time because he was transformed also, not just the buildings that he designed, but also himself as a person. Maybe he had too much success, too many applauses. I don't know, in my opinion, it's a building without glory. 
despite the fact that it is big, yes, but bigness is not enough for um, quality in architecture. If something is big, it doesn't mean that it's also very good. The Museum of Glass, talking about glass, also in Washington, Tacoma in Washington, USA, 2009, there are some interesting things here, but uh, again, I mean, you know, the the beneficiary uh, it was glass itself. It's the Museum of Glass. Uh, we were going to see. You see here. I, I I'm not sure what these things do. They are made of glass and they are perfectly clean. And there are reflections. <clears throat> they are interesting, but they seem to be useless, like the peacock's tail. Otherwise, the, you know, the building is moderately interesting. You know, it's an architecture that attracts your attention. The Museum of Glass. I read recently that in Paris opened the Museum of Paradoxes. Actually, there are in other cities as well, I learned later. But the, the theme interests me, the Museum of Paradoxes. That would be an interesting uh, uh, theme to, to reflect on. How would you make a museum of paradoxes? Here we have the museum of glass. Arthur Erickson, Tacoma, Washington, USA. I wonder this glass never breaks. And, uh, Canada House, Vancouver. The Ericsson Vancouver, British Columbia. This is the this is the his own house. Ah no, no, we didn't yet arrive there. We will. Before we arrive to his own house, we are going to see a proposal for uh, the Trump International Hotel and Tower. Here it is. They're not so unique because such twisted towers uh, were built by other architects. Did Donald, Donald Trump deserve such a tower? I don't know. I'm not convinced. But on the other hand, the tower itself is not, uh, is not really formidable and is not so original. We, we had seen... Uh, you know, twisted towers. Calatrava built one in Malmo in Sweden, much better, and uh, a good number of years before. And other architects, of course, twisted towers are uh, quite frequent. Trump with uh, big letters, dangerously big. If one of those letters falls on someone who wants to enter the Trump Tower, you can imagine. But I, anyway, another tower, twisted or not. And now we end this uh, presentation on Arthur Erickson with his own house, which I praise for its modesty and particularly for its beautiful garden. Truly, very rarely I saw an architect built for himself, but not just for himself, a little house I, I understood was actually uh, you know, a transformation of a garage into into the into the you know the the private home of this uh, very accomplished architect. But the garden is magnificent. So it's in Vancouver, and here is an image. The garden is superlative uh, because it, it it welcomes informality. Maybe he returned to his roots in uh, studying uh, Asian languages. It's a different kind of sensibility, and it it is the it is it is the corner to which he retired after a busy w day work or work day, work day. You see the plan. The house it's very modest on the left. And the garden, it becomes the, the garden actually becomes the true house. If by house we mean something more than just the building that you live in. 
I'm not so convinced about this bench. I think it could have been done more sensitively. Maybe some concrete was used here, and that's not great. But the garden is beautiful. Here is the architect. Understood he lived here for 50 years, half a century. Uh, this platform that he has a chaise long on and he sits on um, is um, with him on it, it's okay. But if you see it here, I find it rather intrusive to the beauty of the of the of the gardening work, to the beauty of uh, uh, and the gentleness of uh, of, of uh, what nature offered. A beautifully designed, but I'm not so sure about this um, resolute uh, square of whatever it is. I don't know this platform on which he places, you know, his chaise long. Uh, conveniently, maybe a little bit too conveniently. I'm a little bit puzzled because the garden is indeed magnificent, but some interventions by him within the garden are a little bit, uh, for my taste, not integrated sufficiently well, a little bit disruptive to the, to the beauty of the, um, you know, of, of nature. You see it here, you know, the this square, this platform is, is, Carlos Carpa would not have done something like this. But uh, Arthur Erickson is not Carlos Carpa. But the house has qualities, it's, so it almost disappeared, it's modest. That, and when I learned that also was, was uh, you know, uh, refurbished or transformed garage and so on, there is something, that, that, that is um, to be applauded here. The beauty of the garden, the modesty of the house. I mean, it has some, you know, uh, so-called civilized spaces, and I hope I have some images here. I regret this thing is here, rather, rather ostentatiously, uh, and, uh, almost brutally. Something like this you would not see at Katsura in Japan. But look at the house from the from the road, you know it's 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 um, very surprising because he assumed the fragility of um, the human existence as expressed through architecture, as expressed through the wood, the aging wood, the darkening wood, and the scale is not at all uh, you know imposing or arrogant or uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, claiming that uh, be behind the walls uh, or the fence that is, um, you know, a great architect or no, there is a modesty here which is authentic. And I like to think that those studies, initial studies of Asian languages made him sensitive in a, in a, in a different way, in a more gentle way towards nature and also towards the stature of uh, the human being in the large scheme of things. Very nice garden. Uh, thank you.